good. Little technological flip. You got it. Okay, I'm good to keep going. Okay, so the role of this webinar is to bring activists, artists, political leaders, and political leaders together, as well as the interested public, to discuss the ways in which the media and citizens around the country can come together to shine a light on the significant efforts being made right now to turn the ERA into this country's 28th Amendment. This webinar specifically focuses on on-the-ground experiences with Schlafly and characters in the series, Mrs. America. Today, we're gonna dive into the characters in the TV show from people who have had real life experiences with Schlafly's and others in the series and, or, and are working for the Equal Rights Amendments. The speakers, filmmakers, and activists will stimulate a broader perspective as they address the current status of the ERA. We encourage you guys to be posting throughout the webinar. Our Instagram is at Generation Ratify and our Twitter is at Gen Ratify, hashtag ERA2020. We will repost whatever you are posting. Before I introduce the panel, I just wanna say a quick thank you to By Agnes Film, directed by Women, Equal Means Equal, Media Equity, and Women Occupy Hollywood for organizing this alongside Generation Radafi. Now for our panelists. First up, we have Jennifer Hall Lee, a noted filmmaker and writer. She directed the 2013 documentary release Feminist, Stories from the Women's Liberation, Liber Women's from the Stories Liberation Movement, and serves as an Altadena Town Council member and the chair of the Altadena Town Council Education Committee. Hi, Jennifer. Next, we have Laura Callow, past chair of past chair of Michigan ERA America, a coalition formed in 1976 following the first three attempts to rescind Michigan's ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. She was introduced into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame in 2010. Hi, Laura. Hi. And finally, we have Bambi Salcedo, a transgender Latina woman who is president and CEO of the Trans Latina Coalition. She, is, she developed the Center for Violence and Prevention and Transgender, Transgender Wellness in Los Angeles. Hi, Bambi. So the way this webinar will work today is uh, after we watch a video, each panelist will be called on to speak for five minutes on this main subject in question. Then I will be in asking uh, individual panelist questions for which they will have two minutes to respond. And we will also be taking questions from the audience. So please, if you have anything you wanna ask, the Q&A box is open throughout the webinar and we will be logging them now and asking them later. So before we start to hear from these incredible panelists, we are going to watch uh, an interview of Phyllis Schlafly conducted by our very own Jennifer Hall Lee. So just give me a moment to screen share this video. Hey, Rachel, we can't hear the video. Oh, you can't hear it? Wait, okay, just give me one moment. I can fix that. I know how to fix that, sorry. Sorry about that. That was one of our big victories. Can you hear it now? And this was the first burial of ERA, and that was the second burial of ERA. That's when I ran for Congress. That's one of the awards I got. I'm Phyllis Schlafly. I'm the president of Eagle Forum, and you are at the Eagle Forum Education Center in St. Louis, which is our national headquarters. Do you know the actual text of the ERA? Sure. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. And then there's a second section which gives the power to the federal government to enforce it. And that was another major argument against it. And when was it written? Oh, it was written in the time of the Women's Suffrage Amendment and about 1920. And all those Congresses had the good sense to leave it buried in the bottom drawer. And then in, um, in 1971, uh, Martha Griffiths, another one I debated, she got enough signatures to get it pulled out of committee. 
and on the floor. I helped candidates get elected, I wrote letters to the editor, all that sort of volunteer thing. In 19 67, I started my Phyllis Schlafly report, which looks just like this. It looks exactly the same as it did 38 years ago. And I wrote about all kinds of different subjects. I would research a subject and write about it, and I sold it by subscription at $5 a year. It's now big $20 a year. And in 1972, February, I wrote one issue called What's Wrong with Equal Rights for Women? And that uh, took off into orbit. Uh, I began to get calls from women who had taken my newsletter, gone to their state legislature, and defeated the Equal Rights Amendment. And uh, that's when it really first came into my life. I hadn't thought about it before then. I, I mean, I grew up in a world where I, this whole idea of women being victims or women being discriminated against, uh, I don't know anything about. When I had my job at the small arms plant, I got the uh, same as the men, and uh, I, I didn't know what they were talking about. Roe versus Wade came along in 1973, which was a big shock to everybody. I think all the surveys show that the country was opposed to abortion before that decision, which did change uh, a whole lot, and that ultimately became kind of the centerpiece of what the feminists were all about and they uh, really adopted that as their main and primary goal, and which tied in to the Equal Rights Amendment, as did the gay rights agenda. The word used in the Equal Rights Amendment was sex, it was not women. And when that came out, um, I looked at what it was apt to do and realized it was a bad deal for women and had no, uh, no good results for women. Uh, the Equal Rights Amendment developed into a 10-year battle, which I took on in 1972, and we finally laid it to rest in 1982. Uh, in all that time, the feminists were not able to show any concrete benefit that it would give to women. Uh, they couldn't claim it had anything to do with, with employment because the employment laws by that time were already sex neutral. When they went on television, they would talk about employment. But when they went to the hearings and when their lawyers spoke, they could not use an employment argument, so there was no advantage to it. At the same time, I had both sons and daughters who were around 18, 20 years old at that time, and my daughters thought it was the silliest thing they ever heard. You're going to give women a, a new constitutional amendment, and the first thing is we'll have to sign up for the draft like our brothers? You have to be kidding. Uh, in, in the mid-70s, we're just coming out of the Vietnam War. The draft was a huge uh, sword that hung over the head of every young man. And to tell young women equality means you have to do this too, it, it was an unsaleable argument. In making the arguments against the Equal Rights Amendment, I showed that it would absolutely, positively require the draft registration of women on an equal basis because the Selective Service Law is a classic example of a sex discriminatory law. It says male citizens of age 18 must register. And uh, the Constitution would change that to persons. Uh, it would require women to be assigned to military combat when they were volunteers in the military. It would have eliminated all the laws of the 50 states that say the husband uh, must be the supporter of his wife, the financial support of his wife. And then as the years went on, we began to realize uh, that one of the effects would be same-sex marriages. If two men show up at the city clerk and say we want a marriage license, and she says, I'm not giving it to you because you're both men. She is obviously discriminated on account of sex. So uh, we would have had same-sex marriages uh, 20, 30 years earlier. The tie-in with abortion was developed by the feminists who developed the legal theory that since abortion is something that happens only to women, then if you deny any benefit regarding abortion, you have denied a benefit to women, which is discrimination on the basis of sex. And this would apply to the taxpayer funding of Medicaid abortions. So that became a big issue, too. When the feminist movement got going, say by 1970, 
they really took over uh, the media, everything that the media had to say about women. So the feminists, uh, most of whom didn't have any children, uh, had got jobs in the media, and we would hear the feminist line all the time on the media, just, just constantly, everlastingly, and their principal legislative goal became the Equal Rights Amendment. So they were pushing it all the time. I think it's safe to say 99% of the media were supportive of the Equal Rights Amendment. Television, whatever was on radio, and certainly the women's magazines. When I uh, spoke at Wellesley College, a number of the young women came in with their faces painted like that in protest against me. And uh, so I just thanked them for promoting my book. Okay, so first of all, thank you all for watching that wonderful and I think so fascinating interview. So just starting off, going straight off of that, Jennifer, can you tell us about some of your experiences with all of this? Sure. You know, she was one of many women that I um, interviewed and uh, I spent several hours with her and it was really, really great. And um Basically, she's charming, she's warm, she's um, funny, actually, you know, meeting her person to person. Uh, I felt that I didn't use her in the um, film because it, there was a lot of factual inaccuracies that I would have had to have countered. And I really didn't feel like doing that. And uh, I would have had to have had other people on there countering it. And I just didn't feel like doing it. However, this was a really good interview and I learned a lot about her. And when I talked to the other feminists I had interviewed, I learned two things that was very interesting to me. One, Karen DeCrow, who was the head of NOW um, for a while, she said, you know, I've met uh, Phyllis and I liked her. I don't agree with her, but I liked her. And that is something I have to feel that I experienced. Um, it was a fun time to be with her. I think she really had a magnetism that she could convey to a lot of people and they were drawn to her. The other thing I learned is that Eleanor Smeal had said, well, you know, it wasn't really Phyllis Schlafly that ended the ERA, it was the corporations. And she kind of rallied the base. So I would say that those things are very, very true. And I also think looking back that she probably would have run the Republican party had she been a man. She really had all of those qualities of understanding how to um, pull the media in and get the media to cover her. She really was great on camera. Every shot we did of her was just perfect. And even her hairstyle, it just cast a silhouette that everywhere you went with this camera, she looked fantastic. And I felt that that was extraordinarily important for people to understand about that time, which was the 1970s and early 80s. And um, it was a different time for media. And she was at the cusp of understanding how to manipulate the media. Thank you so much for that. Cause especially that's something that we think of as Media manipulation is something relatively new in politics and activism. Oh, yeah, it's no. always good to remember that it's been right. around forever. Right. Now, moving right along, Laura, can you tell us about some of your experiences working on pro-ERA uh, initiatives? Yes, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak to a new generation of leaders about the Equal Rights Amendment. My home state of Michigan was among the first to ratify the ERA in May of 1972. All was well until 1976, when a branch of Stop ERA took root and made the first of three attempts to rescind Michigan's ratification. ERA supporting organizations were unprepared. They soon realized that a coordinated response was needed. Michigan ER America was formed so that ERA proponents could speak with one voice to attacks by Stop ERA. I was elected co-chair and became a full-time non-paid activist. This entailed many public speaking engagements, but equally important, I became a truth seeker who spent numerous hours researching anti-ERA distortions and outright lies 
in order to debunk them. Remember, this was a time before the internet and fact-checking site. This research was necessary because the media never made any attempt to refute even the most egregious claims against the ERA. <clears throat> I vividly recall reading my first piece of anti-ERA literature. Two sentences jumped out at me. They were, under ERA, women would lose their right to alimony and mothers would lose their right to child support. Briefly, I thought I was on the wrong side. Being raised in a single parent family, I wanted no part of anything that would make life more difficult for struggling women such as my mother. When checking out these claims, I discovered they were totally false. In the early 70s, 45 states, including Michigan, changed their alimony laws and child support laws to read either party may be granted alimony and child support is paid to the custodial parent. In 1978, the Supreme Court struck down the women only alimony laws in the remaining five states. And I am pleased to tell you that I was had an opportunity to confront Phyllis Schlafly herself. She was a guest on a phone in radio show in the Detroit area. I called in and asked to speak about ERA and alimony. When I was connected, I told Schlafly just what I have told you about all the changes in state alimony law. Phyllis had recently received her law degree, so she was going along with me saying, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then I went in for the kill. Why stop ERA claiming that ERA will cause women to lose their right to alimony? That's a lie. Why are you pr printing that lie? Schlafly sputtered momentarily, and then she recouped. She had the gall to tell me that she wasn't responsible for what Stop ERA printed in Michigan. And I just wish I'd been quick enough to say, well, that's a lie too. Nevertheless, Stop ERA continued printing both lies until 1982, and the antis are still perpetrating the lie about child support in non-ratified states. In the 1970s, the media used what I call false equivalency. They simply printed what the antis said and what the ERA proponents said. There was never any attempt to enlighten the public as to, what to, as to which side was telling the truth. I protested this to reporters several times and always got the same answer. It wasn't up to the media to provide that information. They only had to report what both sides said. False equivalency forced ERA proponents to spend considerable time responding to false claims, such as mandating unisex bathrooms, and not on what the ERA will do and why it is needed. Perhaps this was due to the Fairness Doctrine, a federal requirement that is no longer in effect. TV and radio stations were required to present both sides. Thus, WJR Radio gave me a spot on point of view because an anti-ERA speaker was already spouting her views on a different day. On one occasion, the Detroit News printed a full page article on the ERA. They interviewed me and an opponent. The page was divided in half with an article about me on one side and the uh, pro ER on the other side. And both headlines were entitled or headlined she said, and she said. Consequently, the public was confused on who to believe. This worked in Schlafly's favor. And then there were the pictures, always a studio portrait of Schlafly, but pro ERA activists were often portrayed from unflattering angles. In one angle, Schlafly looked like a plaster saint, while the picture of Bella Abzug looked like a witch. Now, Bella may not have been Hollywood pretty, but she certainly wasn't ugly. I protested to the editor and it helped. After that, the paper began showing Schlafly frowning and looking less saintly. But in real life, Schlafly could be quite unpleasant. She and the chairman of Michigan Stop ERA gave one reporter a terrible tongue lashing because they didn't like something the reporter had written. The reporter was so unnerved, she asked to be removed from covering ERA stories. 
but in the 1970s, ERA articles rarely included the wording of the amendment. Consequently, people often thought the ERA was a lengthy tome. I recall one woman who wrote her US representative asking for a copy of the ERA. When it arrived, she couldn't believe it was a simple 24 word sentence. She called me for verification, then asked, where do they come up with all the bad things they're saying about the ERA? Well, where indeed? But that's the question the media should have asked. Laura, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much for all the incredible work you have done and continue to do. Um, now, moving on, Bambi, I would love to talk to, for you to talk to us a little bit about what sisterhood and fighting for sisterhood means to you. Um, bueno, primero que nada, a mí me gusta darle siempre gracias a mi poder superior por darme la oportunidad de, de estar con ustedes. Um, I know that it was probably hard for some of you to understand uh, what I just said, but it is a customary thing that I do that I always acknowledge my higher power and obviously acknowledge one more day uh, to be able to breathe. Um, I also want to acknowledge the beautiful and amazing people who are joining us today and obviously the young and vibrant, beautiful people who has helped to put this amazing uh, panel together. Um, so, you know, as, as you stated, Rachel, um, I am a very privileged trans Latina immigrant woman um, who has the opportunity and the privilege to lead a national advocacy organization that um, does a lot of advocacy, but also provides direct supportive and life-saving services to trans people here in Los Angeles. Um, and as a trans woman, right? Uh, and when we talk about sisterhood and all this beautiful and amazing information that I'm listening to and that I have obviously known about before, right? Um, when we talk about the Equal Rights Amendment, right? Um, and when it comes to the inclusion of trans women, and the experiences of trans women, I have to say that there's still a lot of work that needs to happen in that regard. I think um, the Equal Rights Amendment, obviously it's, it's something that in itself, right? It says equal rights. Um, but my, in my own experience, uh, being in the larger women's movement, and I'm not just talking about the feminist movement, but in the larger women's movement um, has been uh, not very pleasant per se, right? Um, and so, although there is amazing and beautiful women who obviously support, has supported me and continue to support and are well intended and want to uh, understand, right, this concept of womanhood. But in the overall movement, I think um, there's a lot of education that needs to happen. There's a lot of sensitivity that needs to happen. And I think, you know, we need to really understand, right, like um, what exactly the Equal Rights Amendment means, right? Um, because if we are talking about uh, equal rights amendment uh, or equal rights overall, right? Um, we need to also understand that equal does not mean the same as equity, right? And so there's two different things. Um, and I think we also need to uh, consider and uh, really rethink uh, what this concept of womanhood is. Um, so there is a lot of work that needs to happen. And again, I don't want to minimize the beautiful and amazing work that has been done over the years to really, for, for us to get to where we are in 2020, right? Um, but also it's important for all of us to really understand what this concept of social justice is, 
right? Uh, if we believe in social justice and if we believe in the Equal Rights Amendment, then it's, those two things are together. And um, we, can be, we cannot be exclusionary through this process, right? And so um, I think there's definitely work that needs to be done. There's definitely um, work that has been done and there's, again, um, beautiful and amazing feminists and women who have advocated for you know, trans lives and um, for trans women to be accepted in women's circles. Um, but there's definitely a lot of work that needs to happen in that regard. Um, and I'm gonna say also that, you know, in order for us to really accomplish uh, equal rights and equity within the movement, right? Um, we need to really organize collectively. We have to understand and really embrace not just our individual power, but also our collective power and be able to transform uh, the way society has not, um, you know, supported the Equal Rights Amendments. Um, so what is it gonna take for us to mobilize? What is it gonna take for us to, to ensure that not just in 2020, but beyond, you know, um, equal rights are really granted to everyone, including trans women within the women's movement. Uh, so thank you again for the opportunity to be included in this process. Thank you so much for your words of wisdom. I know that that's a message that I think so many people like need to hear. And again, thank you so much for being with us today. So we are going to move on to the Q&A portion. As a reminder, our, I will be asking our panelists questions, some that I have written, some that come from the Q&A box, and they will each have uh, about two minutes to answer a question. Um, if you have something you wanna ask, please put it in the Q&A box. We'd love to hear from you. So starting up first, uh, Jennifer, obviously you have worked, you sat down and spoken to Phyllis Schlafly. What do you think, um, for those of us who watch the show, what is the biggest aspect of her that we're missing by only watching the show and not having met her in real life? What is the most key thing that you think those of us who don't have that one-on-one -on -one experience with her may not understand about her? I feel that she really came across as being very honest one-on-one -on -one and believes wholeheartedly in what she believes. I, I don't think she was a cagey person, really. She really did have those heartfelt beliefs. However, I did get the feeling the whole time I was sitting there that she understood some of the things I asked were true. Like I asked about, you know, I don't think I'd be able to be a filmmaker if the feminist movement didn't come along, which is absolutely true. And I said, you know, I went into film in the early 80s and I was, you know, one of a couple of women, but that I don't think that would have happened to me in the 70s. And the way we were treated, we had this framework of feminism that ran through the country that we could hang on to. And she said, well, now I, I said it sort of like that. She said, well, that's largely true, but... And she tried to veer it her way. So I had this feeling she was having trouble after the successes of the women's movement to stand on the platform she had helped to create and that she really did create. And she kept trying to veer it away, but that's where her really ingenuity on dealing with the media came in. Thank would... you so much. <laughs> um, and for Laura, uh, one of the most notable parts of every episode of Mrs. America is at the beginning, you see a flash screen, any amount of 38 states have ratified the ERA. But in reality, when you actually get down to watching the show and how it's portrayed now, you see very little of each individual state fight. And we know that that was really how this battle was fought. How do you feel about how both in Mrs. America and, uh, you know, back when 
it was happening, how do you feel that the media really portrayed like the state by state fight? Do you feel like it was portrayed accurately or even like elevated? Well, I have to admit that I haven't watched Mrs. Uh, America because I lived it and I didn't know whether I could sit through it again. But uh, uh, Lafley mentioned Martha Griffiths who came was a representative from Michigan who pushed the ERA through. Uh, she got a discharge petition to blast it out of committee and that's how we finally got it. Uh, Congress to ratify or to propose it, but I believe that overall the media didn't talk much about the ERA. In fact, I became active over the issue of discrimination in credit uh, to change to change the credit laws, and I'm very proud to say that we did that both in my state and nationally. And you young women out there, when you use your credit card, it was one for you. But anyway, I, that was in 1974, and that's when I learned about the ERA, and my own state had ratified it in 1972, and I had not heard of it before that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, for those of us who have been watching, but even if you haven't, um, one of the biggest threads in the series Mrs. America is about how much uh, gay and trans activists had to really fight for their place within the women's liberation movement. And that is a fight that is very far from over. So Bambi, I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but if you could go more into specifics about what you think modern day women's movements, such as like the current fight for the ERA, um, the Me Too movement, what can, and the Women's March, what can we be doing to better elevate and include our gay and trans women and allies? Oh my. <laughs> I mean, so I, was, I was thrilled to see me too. In fact, I felt like I'd been waiting for them to show up for, you know, uh, almost 25 years because I was part of a, a committee uh, called uh, the ERA Summit. And we began meeting in 1990 to find a way to jumpstart the ERA. And we could think of nothing for a couple of years until the Madison Amendment, that 203 year old Madison Amendment was ratified. And that's when uh, we developed the three state strategy. And uh, it took a long time for, I think uh, some people, some women at the national level to in organizations to uh, see it as a, as a worthwhile uh, effort. However, I'm very pleased that women in the states, the unratified states lashed onto it right away. And I know that there were hundreds of them that I'll never meet, but those wonderful women kept pushing and pushing and they have succeeded. And I'm very grateful to them. Laura, thank you so much. So Bambi, if you could touch on what you think are the things that modern day women's movements really need to do to include and elevate uh, gay and trans voices, that would be fantastic. To guarantee what? Oh, I, I'm asking Bambi a question. Excuse me. Yeah, um, uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, I, I think there's, the question is, is really complicated, right? Because there's not necessarily a cookie cutter way of doing things, right? Um, I think the first step that um, we have to do again, individually, and then translated into the collective really is to assess ourselves and assess our values and really think about um, how is it that we can be inclusive uh, through this movement, right? Um, again, um, unfortunately, there are, you know, many individuals who, um, are part of the movement, the women's movement, and just feminist, and just the multiple and overlapping movements, right? Who are very um, sort of like have narrow-minded way of thinking in terms of like genitalia, right? Like if you don't have a vagina, then you do not qualify as a woman, for instance, right? Um, and so, 
you know, I, I think there's a lot of education that needs to happen. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I am hopeful. I have hope. You know, that's one of the things that obviously, obviously drives me to do the work that I do. And I do hope that um, we are going to be able to transform um, how we think, right? Because I think also what happens oftentimes is that um, even within larger movements, right? Um, those of us who have been oppressed, once we get like a, a certain status, right? Then also become oppressors, right? And so I think what is important is for we'll always be reminded of who we are, where we come from, um, where we're going and what are those principles that drive us to do the work that we do. Um, and if we are able to do that, then we're able to understand um, what needs to be done. And I, I think those are just a couple of uh, different steps that could be accomplished and they are not really complicated, but really understanding, you know, what is, again, um, what is this notion of social justice and how do we embrace that and how we are inclusive of all of those individuals who are the most marginalized, right? Um, if we are able to see the lives uh, and experiences of trans women, right? And we, we can see that trans women are, we experience extreme violence, right? Simply for, for who we are. And, you know, we can be violent to our own people, right? And so if I am trying to be part of a collective and organize, but then I'm walking into spaces that are, are violent, then obviously uh, it's counterproductive, right? And so we really need to be aware of how we do things and how we are going to continue to build an inclusive movement. Thank you so much. Uh, we have some questions coming in from the chat, so we're gonna move to those. Uh, starting with Jennifer, uh, could you talk a little bit more about what you said earlier about corporate influence in, uh, about the role of corporate influence in stopping the passage of the ERA? Oh, you're so muted. <laughs> I'm trying to be polite and always remember all these Zoom things going on, right? You gotta, you gotta mute, you gotta mute. Yeah. Right. Corporations um, lobby, they have huge amounts of money. They push their agenda and it's very hard for the people to live and function in a democracy where politicians are supposed to answer to the people. So the corporations in the 60s and 70s were not as large as they are now. And this is something that's really important to remember, I think. We've always had corporations, not always, but we've had corporations. But now they're as big as whole countries. They're as big as countries. And this is partly why we're having such difficulty right now in our country. But back then, corporations did not want to pay equal pay. And Phyllis Schlafly kept talking about the Equal Pay Act and how, well, we have the Equal Pay Act and we don't need the ERA. But clearly, if that were true, the corporations would not have put up such a fight and they would, have, would not have lobbied as hard. So I think this is an issue that we can really think about today in activism um, because the multinational corporations that we have today are so super powerful that they are gonna to continue to guide our culture and guide our politics until we can find a way to um, rein them in. Thank you so much. I know that obviously that is a thread of politics that is present until this day, which is the unfortunate, unfortunate corporate influence over our national laws. So at least it didn't just start. Um, moving along, Laura, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you think the most ideal, like what current ERA activists today should be doing? What is the best strategies for us to continue getting, because again, we have our 38 states, but how incredible would it be if all 50 states ratified individually? So for those still working for ratification in their, their states, what are your recommendations and your suggestions? 
Well, I think probably the most practical thing is we need to work on Congress to remove the deadline uh, because just recently a case brought before the, by the three state attorneys general, uh, there's been a move to dismiss it saying that it's not an issue for the courts, it's up to Congress. And it needs to be made a national issue. People need to know that the ERA is not ratified uh, or is still not part of, it's ratified, but not part of the constitution. And people think it's in the constitution. In fact, a February poll by, uh, I forget, but a February poll showed that I think 80% of the people think that the ERA is already there and it's not. And Mrs. America at least shows them that it's not. Uh, so one of the things I would urge everyone there is to vote for an equality candidate. I'm not saying Republican or Democrat because uh, the ERA is a nonpartisan issue. It's been supported by both parties and you just want a candidate who will vote to remove the time limit and put the Equal Rights Amendment into the Constitution because that's where it belongs. Thank you so much. I just wanna echo Laura's sentiment about how important it is to vote for pro-equality and pro-ERA candidates come your primary season and November. Um, to do a little self-plug, Generation Ratify is part of an elect ERA campaign in which uh, every week we phone bank and text bank and campaign for individuals all across the country who are pro ERA. So if you have any questions about that or would like to get involved and work on an elect ERA campaign, please uh, look us up on socials, DM us. We are happy to respond to you with any questions you have about that. Um, so another question uh, for Bambi. How do you think that we can engage the LGBTQ community on ERA um, ratification more so than they already are? What can we as the activists in this movement do to um, involve those communities who have such a rich history of community organizing and activism? How can we align our causes and work together? Um, yeah, um, thank you so much. This is um, definitely a complex question, um, right? Um, but I think one of the things that I, um, that I can think of is that we really have to think about how we organize, right? It is unfortunate, right, that um, beautiful and amazing people who have fought hard to make sure that the era is there. And it's a disgrace that in 2020, we still don't have that, right? And so how do we organize? And I think the way I'm thinking and the way we do organizing at our organization, and I know that's how, um, you know, individuals have done in the past is that we really have to organize as if our lives depend on it, right? And we have to also, uh, because actually, because our lives do depend on it, right? And we also have to understand that um, with this global pandemic, things have shifted drastically, right? And so how are we going to adapt to the new way of organizing, you know? And so um, we definitely need to make sure that, again, we continue to be inclusive. That's really key, right? Um, that within our movements are do not exclude and oppress and marginalize people um, because then you know, we, we, we want to accomplish what we want. Um, and so, you know, I, I, un dicho que dice la unión hace la fuerza, right? Like unity, you know, uh, turns into strength, right? Um, but if we continue to be marginalizers and if we continue to be oppressors and if we can 
continue to be exclusionary, then we're not going to be able to accomplish uh, what we want. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Again, it is so important because you know, these are two communities who both have such rich histories of activism and it's important to get them on the same page and to be working for each other's causes because, you know, um, you know, oppression is not over until no one is oppressed anymore. And I think that's something that all activists should be conscious of. Um, so, uh, sorry. This is a question I think I would love for everyone to have a crack at just going around in the order. Um, so again, whether you're watching or not, the Mrs. America series uh, is always suddenly showing that Phyllis knows what ERA activists are talking about because she's living it, whether it's um, her controlling husband or congressmen who like to flirt with her and attempt to take advantage of her. Um, and what do you say, like, what can we do to show women who, despite living the same experiences as us and knowing deep down that they are not in the position that they should be, but still actively work against women's rights, what can we say to them to bring them into our group, to liberate them and show them that they did not only can be better, but deserve better? So starting off with Jennifer. Okay. Um... Just, can you just shorten that sentence just a little bit more? Just uh, how, yeah, sorry. Because so, I'm not looking at it. No, it's okay. In short, how can we um, liberate women who are actively working against women's movements and bring them over to our side? Yeah, that's a really big issue, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think that there are a lot of women uh, because of privilege feel that they are benefiting from the system as it is, which is defined by men. And I, what I personally try to do is to bring people along to see a different future for all of us, um, such as it is absolutely mm -hmm. presidential, it is absolutely um, American values to put children's rights at the top of our agenda politically. If we talk, I talk about something like that. So as I talk about, and I bring that into my framework, I find that people who normally wouldn't agree with me, they start to ask more questions. And sometimes if you just get a little wiggle room, you know, that's all you need is a little bit of wiggle room. People start to think a bit on their own. Um, that, that, that's one thing. That that's one. But. No, thank you so much. That is an incredible strategy. Uh, Laura, what do you think? How can we bring in women who are actively working against us and bring them into our movement? Well, that is a tremendous challenge. Uh, I found I've had women, uh, first of all, I've talked about uh, personal experiences such as, uh, and especially things that have happened to my mother uh, but I also have had women say to me, well, I've never been discriminated against. And my answer to them was that I had a very happy marriage, a very kind and loving husband. So I've never been beaten, but that doesn't mean that there aren't women out there be being beaten. And uh, consequently, don't we want to have laws that protect all women who, who possibly may face discrimination. And even if it doesn't apply to me personally, it does help other women. Thank you so much. And also that's so important thinking about not necessarily framing the conversation around ourselves, but on those who we know are in more difficult situations and have less privilege than us. Uh, Bambi, what are your thoughts? How can we bring in people who are actively working against us? Um. Are, are we talking about like within our in internal movements? Um, no, from the outside more so, like women who work actively against women's rights, people who are, you know, tweeting like repeal the 19th. How do we show those women that they deserve more and that they should be working with us? Um, well, I mean, I think 
one, I, I definitely agree with Jennifer, right? We need to definitely have a collective agenda, right? Um, but I mean, the nature of the work, right? Like there are always going to be people who agree and people who disagree, right? Um, I just wish that, you know, other women, for instance, um, and, I, and I guess in some ways, you know, these are the individuals that I was referring to when I was talking about being exclusionary and being, um, you know, just not welcoming when it comes to trans women, right? Um, and so it's, it's a tough one, but I, I think that those individuals really need to do like a conscious um, inventory really about what, what their principles are, what their beliefs are, you know, and also understand that like, if you believe in something, again, social justice, really, I'm, I use social justice as a frame to do the work that I do. And I hope that other people think in those ways. Um, and if people are able to understand what social justice really means, then, you know, there won't be no divisions. There won't be no necessarily, um, you know, differences of opinions, if you will, right? Because we are all on the same page. Um, having said that, there's always going to be people who do not like us, people who do not care for us, and there's actual people who want to kill us, right? And so how do, how do we um, just protect ourselves, you know, um, oftentimes, because I don't believe in expending my energy and trying to convince people who have this way of mentality um, that like it's going to be super hard to uh, convince, right? Uh, why don't I just work with people who their hearts are there, um, but they still need to like get a little more education and sensitivity um, and just like get those individuals to really, like, really, you know, get with it rather than those who want to see me dead. No, thank you so much. That's also so important to think about how the women's movement may need to accept those who are actively fighting for a place in it before they start looking to bring in people from the outside. Because the truth of the situation is we do have the numbers and we just aren't utilizing everyone the way we should be because there are difficulties. Um, we have time for one last question, but it's gonna have to be a very short answer. Uh, if you all just want to say like one sentence, 30 seconds of what you want um, our wonderful participants to take away from this panel today, starting with Jennifer. I would like for people to take away this. The first real narrative about the women's movement in our culture is this one, right? Mrs. America. I mean, has there been another narrative film on the women's movement? I really don't think so. I can't name one, maybe it was marginal. The first one is in the next century, the following century. It's an issue about women and technology. Thank you so Fear much. Technology. Well, repeat the question. Just what's one thing you want the viewers of this panel to take away in like 30 seconds? Well, we really haven't talked about why we need the ERA, but it is a matter of simple justice. We were not in the constitution. We were deliberately left out and it's time to put us in. Thank you so much. And Bambi, just 30 seconds. What do you want the people watching this panel to take away? I mean, I definitely wanna uh, agree with both of my uh, colleagues. Um, you know, it is time, right? It is time for us to wake up. It is time for us to really understand the power that we have and understand that only together we'll get to the finish line. Um, so that's, I would just wanna say that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much to our lovely panelists and to all of you guys who joined us from home. Uh, these webinars are meant to elevate conversations around Mrs. America and the ERA and to drive people to take action. 
So afterwards, we will be emailing out a toolkit that has information on all of our panelists and the works that they are leading, as well as calls to action for the ratification of the ERA. Also important to note is that we recorded this panel as we will be recording all the others that come after it and placing them on uh, Generation Ratifies YouTube channel to be watched again later and shared with anyone you think would benefit from hearing this wonderful conversation we had today. Um, our webinar series will continue next Thursday from five to six Eastern Standard Time. And that topic will be on the ground. Oh, and that topic will be released at a very soon time on all of our social media. So stay tuned and please, we hope to see you then as well. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.